welcome to Nightline. Scott and I are so happy to be here tonight. Thanks, Scott. And we're even happier that you've decided to join us. We hope that you'll stay yes. with us. We have a lot of good things coming up. Um, our guests are Reverend Michael Hodge, pastor of Locust Hill Baptist Church in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. And also the Haynes family will be singing for us throughout the program. And of course, we're going to be hearing the Word, but we're going to be hearing the Word of God in song as well as the spoken Word. Our prayer partners are here and they're ready to take your phone calls. They will be happy to pray with you. You can give them a call at 864-244-1616. Or if you had rather go online, you can go to WGGS16.com, click on prayer, and type in your comments, your requests, whatever you have. And uh, so we hope that you will stay with us for all this time because I think you're going to like what you hear, both in the spoken word as well as in the music. Right now, here's the Haynes family with I've Come Here to Tell You. Exalt his name together, don't you think we should? Oh, I've come here to tell you that the Lord is good. He's good, good. Anytime, every time, all the time, good. All the time, good. I've come here to tell you that the Lord is good. His mercy will endure forever. So let's exalt his name together. Don't you think we should? I've come here to tell you that the Lord is good. So let's exalt his name together. Don't you think we should? I've come here to tell you that the Lord is good. He's good. 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 I've come here to tell you that the Lord Thank you so much for that song. Amen. The Lord is good. He Amen. is Always. good. <laughs> Always. And Scott's going to get us started on our scripture for tonight. Amen. First part of our scripture comes from Psalms 119, verses 24, 25, and 28. It says, Deal with your servant according to your mercy, and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right 
and I hate every false way. You know, David is here. He's talking about deal with your servant according to your mercy. You know, in God's word, he also says your, his mercies are new every morning. So every morning we wake up, we, we have new mercies coming our way every day. The mercies of God is forever. And he talks about it. Deal with your servant according to your mercies. <clears throat> and he says, and teach me your statutes. Well, what is statutes? Are we look in the, if I looked in the dictionary, it said statutes means it's a written law. God's word is law. But he also, in the Bible, it also means to inscribe or to cut into. You know, back when we looked at the Ten Commandments, when God gave the Ten Commandments, he wrote them and inscribed them, cut into stone and gave them to Moses. Mm -hmm. But his word also is inscribed into our hearts, cut deep into our hearts, that we wouldn't forget it that it would always be there, not only in our mind, but in our spirit, in our heart deep. That's where it needs to be, needs to always. It'll be there forever. Be able to take it out. God said he'll bring all things back to our remembrance. He'd bring his word back to us. But there's only one way it can come back is if we put it in. So let's look at his word. Let's keep it into our hearts. And he says, I am your servant. We're all servants of the Most High God. You need to be a servant. We, I need to be a servant. We all do. There's a difference between being a servant and being a slave. A servant is doing the will of God. It's, it's wanting to. And a slave does not have that. He doesn't want to be. But we're all servants. Service to God. He said, I am your servant. Give me understanding. We need the understanding that comes from God's word. And if we keep it and hide it in our hearts, we'll always remember it. We'll know to do it every morning. It, it comes natural. At first it doesn't, but eventually it just comes natural. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find ourselves doing it always. Amen. Staying in the same Psalm 119, Verses 129, 30, and 33, they say, God, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. God's testimonies give us wonderful insight into who He is and the greatness of His power to redeem us through Jesus Christ and the greatness of His love to redeem us through Jesus Christ. His Word opens the door for us to receive His grace and that grace influences our hearts. It changes our hearts. And it will be reflected in our lives so that we can give our own testimony to this world what Jesus has done in us and he can do the same thing in them. When we choose to establish our lives on the word of God, we have spiritual light to understand those things that we never understood before. Suddenly the word of God just becomes real to us. We understand it, it's clear. It makes perfect sense, just like when you turn the light on in a dark room. You turn that light on and suddenly you can see clearly everything that's there. You see the arrangement of the furniture that's there, so you can actually make your way through the room without stubbing your toe on something, without running into something. How many times have you ever done that in the dark? But with the light, we can see we can see and we don't have to do that. His word will direct our steps. If we say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to do what you've called me to do. And I know that in the Bible, your word, it gives me the way to walk. And when we do that, we won't be stumbling through a dark world anymore. We're going to be walking in the light. 
If we allow the Word of God to be our guide, we're going to have light and we're going to have life more abundantly, okay? We don't have to be ruled by habits, sins, past failures, or any other thing that will bring us down. And iniquity no longer has dominion over us. Here's the Haynes family again singing Angel Band. Thank you for that great song. It's good to know that the angels are around us and they're here to minister to us. God has told them to do that for us. We have with us Reverend Michael Hodge, pastor of Locust Hill Baptist Church in Taylors, South Carolina. And Michael, it's so good to have you back with us. Just very grateful for the opportunity to be here again. And you always have a, a great conversation when we're here. And so I appreciate the invite to be able to to come again, yeah, I just want to give an in kind of an update on uh, the ministry. Uh, we've just celebrated now a year of serving there at Locust Hill and Great. Traveler's Rest and uh, never would have imagined that this was really where God would have us at this season. We were serving at our home church where I grew up, yeah. had a great ministry, and we just knew about a year ago we wrestled with that call to take that step, love the folks of our home church, and yet God called us to serve, and it has been such a wonderful year. We've seen God's blessing over the past year serving the folks at Locust Hill, and and really we can see how God is at work in several areas where I see God at work at our church really is a multi-generational impact from our children 
We've got a great couple that leads our children's ministry that's oh, leading good. them to, to know the Word of God, but in addition to know how they can defend their faith, even as children, doing an awesome job. Our student wow. pastor oh, yeah. is out in the community with the school and serving. The students love him. Mm -hmm. He's doing an awesome job. Our, our senior adults are led by a couple that really is caring for them well. Uh, one of the prayers I had for our adults was that spiritual conversations would be often and just a normal fabric of the life of the church. And I'm yes. seeing that more and more on Wednesday nights with our discipleship, but also Sundays as we have sermon discussion groups. So God's at work, excited about yeah. it. I love what he's doing. And as I, I thought about what I could share this evening, I reflected back on something that really uh, God used in our church. It was a series on a topic we don't talk about a lot, the topic of lament. And we recognize that every time we gather in worship, there's no entrance exam. Everyone can come. There are those coming in. They're ready to celebrate. They're at a place of joy, excitement. But we also recognize there are folks that are coming in broken. They're going through a hardship. And so as we, as we gather in worship, we recognize that we worship together with those that are celebrating and those that are suffering. And so this evening, we're going to look at Psalm 77. And so the viewers at home, they can turn in their Bibles to Psalm 77. I'm going to read from the ESV, but I'll also reference the King James Version so folks will recognize well the text that we're okay. using. And so here's the, the key verses from Psalm 77. I'll begin in verse 1. The writer says, I cried aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In, in the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. The King James says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. I mean, those are some tough words to say, yeah. I was troubled, I was complaining, I was overwhelmed. Yeah. But you know, the important thing is to realize every time we gather in worship, those folks are there. Mm -hmm. And they need to know that they can bring their praise to the Lord, but they can also bring their heartache. And that's one of the blessings of this ministry. There's prayer partners that are going to be able to receive those prayer needs. And even as we walk through this text this evening, I think that there are going to be folks that will say, I need to cry aloud to God and I need somebody to join me in that. There's a, a great resource that, that I used in the series by a fellow named Mark Vrogop, kind of an interesting name, yeah. but Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. It's a great resource. Wow. This is what he says about lament. He said, prayerful lament is better than silence. I thought that's a great word mm -hmm. to say, sometimes we're tempted to stay quiet. We're hurting, we're going through a difficult time, and we think, I I'll just keep it in. I'll just keep this to myself, but realizing, we have the opportunity to bring it before the Lord. That's what I see here in our text is that, mm -hmm. that heart being poured out to the Lord. And, you know, if we think that we can come before the Lord, I want to say we can be encouraged because the Bible is not afraid of the language of lament. In mm -hmm. fact, about a third of the Psalms are lament Psalms. <laughs> and are. so the writers of the Psalms were not afraid to just pour out their brokenness when they were facing something and they questioned, I don't even know which way this is gonna go, I don't know what the answer is right now. They, they wrote it down as, as voices of praise to God, of, of just pouring out their voices. And so that's what we see here. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God. So what is lament? One of the definitions that, that Mark Brogop gives is this. He said, lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. And that's so important because as mm -hmm. I cry out to God, I have a goal. And that goal is that I would trust the Lord once again. Yeah. And so that's my prayer. I'm in a, in a place and, and maybe I'm, I'm struggling. I can't explain what I'm going through. But I want to see that prayer of pain lead me back to trusting God. Yeah. In fact, if you look in the verse, it says, it really a, a statement of faith. He says, and he will hear me. The King James, King James says, he gave ear to me. So that's saying when I don't feel like God is right there, maybe I don't feel like worshiping. He made a statement of faith. I believe God is here. I believe God is listening to me. And so in our lament, we just pour out to the Lord what's going on. Uh, Richard Foster in his book on prayer, he said this. He said, the lament psalms 
teach us to pray our inner conflicts and contradictions. They allow us to shout out our forsakenness in the dark caverns of abandonment and then hear the echo return to us over and over until we bitterly recant of them only to shout them out again. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful word on just our prayer lifting up to the yeah. Lord. Yeah. And we see that here in the Psalm 77 here, that echo of lament that echoes out from the heart as we pray in pain. So if we keep going there in Psalm 77, it says, In the day of trouble I seek the Lord. Just yeah. pouring out, going to the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. I, when I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled, I cannot speak. The King James in verse 3 says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. And so I think that's a, a word of encouragement to us, just to say bring our complaints to the Lord. We can pray our struggles. Yeah. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Romans, he said of prayer of this type, he said, it's a continuous violent action of the Spirit as it's lifted up to God. Mm -hmm. And maybe we've been there. Maybe folks at home are kind of yeah. in that place where they would say, I'm struggling. I'm walking through a hardship right now, and I need to just lift it to the Lord. That's a prayer of lament. It's not a prayer of accusation. It's a prayer of even confusion where you say, God, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on right now. I'm not sure the, the season that I'm in. And so as we think about that, that idea, one of the ways that J.I. Packer describes the, the Christian life, he describes it as a hiking trip. Now, I don't know if you like hiking or not. I've used this illustration before, and if people love hiking, they love the illustration. If they don't like it, they say, no, not my favorite. <laughs> but when you think about hiking, especially a place like Table Rock, it's a challenge. And when you're on that hike, there are places all along the way where you say, I'm going to give up. I'm going to yeah. quit. Yeah. And the reason you, you can't see the destination, you can't see the summit yet. But when you can catch just a, glimmer, a glimpse of that, then you say it's worth it. Yeah. You keep pressing on. And I wonder when we think about lament and even folks at home, where are they in that journey? Maybe they're at a place where they can't see the other side of the, the wall that they're up against, that mountain in front of them. Yeah. And they need to just say, you know what, has somebody else walked this journey? Someone to encourage them to, to keep going. Uh, and so that's the, the prayer that we have as we look at the, the prayers in Psalm 77, that prayer of lament, of don't give up, don't quit, keep going to the Lord. You know, there is a place even, um, I think it was Jeremiah the prophet, he said, Lord, you have been to me a deceitful Brooke. Right. And I think, oh, Jeremiah, yeah. God's not deceitful. Right. You know, you're, you're horrified at something like that. And, and it's like, he is certainly not deceitful. Right. And, um, but Jeremiah was just, I don't think he was trying to say God was deceitful, actually. I think he was in lament. He exactly. was saying, God, this is how I feel. Right. Because we have this idea, I have to delight in the Lord. And so if we ever have anything where I'm not delighting, there's almost a mm -hmm. sense of guilt. And yet when we come to the Psalms, we see this liberation of, you know, I can just come before the Lord with all that I am. And in the next segment, we'll talk about a little bit of that freedom we have to just come to the Lord with all that we have. Yeah. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to, to try to at, mask over what we're going through. And, and so Mark Brogop, he says this, Lament is the song you sing, believing that one day God will answer and restore. <laughs> Lament invites us to pray through our struggle with a life that is far from perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and we recognize that, that you know, folks that are walking through a hardship, that we come in that posture of confusion, mm -hmm. even a posture of desperation. Yeah. And as we walk through the series in our church, it was amazing how many folks were walking through those very seasons. And we may never have spoken in to those folks that were gathering with us in worship had we not walked through that series on lament. And so you look out in the congregation and you see a, an attitude of celebration. In fact, so many of our songs are, are great yeah. songs of celebration, and they ought to be. But we also realize we need to speak that song of brokenness before the Lord, bringing what's heavy on our hearts and, and just laying it before the Lord, knowing that He hears us yeah. and we don't have to hide those challenges that we're walking through. 
I think there are a lot of people who are broken in different ways. Right. And some are very, very broken. Right. And some are so broken that they realize, I brought this on myself, so mm -hmm. there's no hope. Right. Kind of broken. Right. But then there is a brokenness. There is a good brokenness. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. That we that we need to have, and yeah, I right. think that plays in with this too. Absolutely. Sometimes we do need to lament over our sins. Absolutely. Yep. We need to be led to a place of of repentance, and that yes. may be that that prayer of lament. In reality, needs to be tonight a prayer of salvation to yes. realize that they've been pursuing everything the world would offer as a an escape from whatever they're facing, but realizing tonight that in Christ alone is the hope of our redemption, our salvation, and all we have to do is place our faith in Jesus Christ, repenting of our sin and brokenness yes. so that He would redeem us, save us from our sin. Yes. And, you know, so all brokenness is not bad if it brings us to a point. And I think that's what you were talking about Absolutely. just a little while ago. We can cry out to God and right. He hears. And we're going to come back to this psalm in just a, a moment. But to see this very clear invitation that we can cry aloud to God and for everyone to hear that promise and He will hear me. Yes. He's listening. And so we can come before Him when we're at our lowest point, when we're celebrating and praising God. We can lift up that word to the Lord and you will hear us. Absolutely. You may be broken tonight. You may be broken. Cry out to God. Whatever the reason you're broken, cry out to God. It says, I cried unto the Lord and he heard my voice. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful thing. And it's not that we have to try to hide anything from God because he knows it all anyway. So if we're broken because we messed up, he knows it anyway. And so we might as well just say, Lord, you saw what I did. You know who I am. You know what's inside of me. Wash me, cleanse me, make me whole. And he will. When we cry out to the Lord, he hears our voice. And he loves you tonight, whoever you are and whatever you're doing. He loves you. We're going to have another song right now from the Haynes family. The blood covered it all. Jesus. 
just one drop of his precious blood will cover of Jesus covered it all. Whatever you've done, His blood's covered it. We just have to take that and say, I receive what you did, Jesus, for me on the cross. Give our lives to Him and He will wash us and cleanse us and we can walk in the light. Well, we're back with Reverend Michael Hodge and I want you just to continue in this, in this vein of lament um, from the scripture. Well, I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to just uh, open up the scripture and allow it to teach us. And again, this theme of lament is something that ministered to a lot of folks in our church. And we realize this prayer of pain that leads us to trust is so desperately needed because we're going to walk through victories and we're going to walk through valleys. And so my prayer as we are looking at Psalm 77 and hopefully we'll get to look at another text in just a moment my prayer is that people will trust God with their need, that they won't fear that they can't bring that before the Lord. So even tonight, that they'll just bring their needs before Him. So we're going to go back to Psalm 77. If folks are just joining us in home, at home, that's where we're studying this evening. And so I just used the image of hiking. I didn't get a real excited response from you, so I'm assuming <laughs> not real thrilled about going out hiking with me. But we realize hiking is challenging. But one thing is great about it. It's beautiful, too. You get out and you see the scenery. So we're, we're going on a flat hike now, Miss Patty. How's that? Is I'm that better? I'm comfortable okay, with that. Okay, good. Yes. But, you know, as you go out, you get to see the sights. But as you begin to go up a bit of an ascent, you realize, oh, things just changed mm -hmm. a little bit. And that's what life so, so much is like. We go along, we're cruising, we're good. And then all of a sudden, we feel the pressure against us. And we say, oh, we're climbing now. And that's what we see here in Psalm 77. Life has took a turn, you're beginning to climb, and you realize the resistance, and so what am I going to do? Well, what we see in Psalm 77 is an invitation to bring our questions to the Lord. In fact, as you look across this Psalm 77, I'll just very quickly read six questions that are all throughout this Psalm. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? We see that in verse 7. Verse 8, has his steadfast love forever ceased? In verse 8, are his promises at an end for all time? In verse 8, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And then in verse 13, what God is great like our God? And so that's the emotions he was experiencing, yeah. one question after another. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a hard place, that's what all you have is questions. You don't have that's the answers. It. You don't know what's going to be on the other side. And so we see a pattern here that we can just keep coming to the Lord. And so what that tells me is the writer and most of our headings tell us this is a psalm of Asaph, that Asaph was writing 
in a place of confusion again, yeah. a place of desperation. He's perplexed. He, he didn't have all the answers. He's not sure which way this is going to go. In fact, if we're just dropping in the text, we're kind of wondering, where's Asaph going to end up? Is yeah. he going to end up in a place of despair or in a place of hope? Now remember, a lament is a prayer of pain that leads us to trust. So that's our prayer is that as we ask these questions that it's leading us to trust the Lord all the more. One of the questions we see in the Psalms, you'll recognize Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? That's a desperate just question before the Lord. And Mark Brogop, he highlights that lament Psalms are, are demonstrations that there's no need to feel ashamed when we don't know the answer. And so our invitation is to just come before the Lord. God, here's what I'm facing. Here are the questions that are flooding me right now. And so I'm coming to you because I don't know the answers right now. And what it says to me is I don't have to hide with those questions. Yeah. When our folks come into worship, they don't have to put on a mask and hide what's going on in their life. Hiding didn't turn out too well in the Bible. All the way back no. in the garden. <laughs> The sin that separated that perfect fellowship between a holy God and now sinful man, what did they do? They hid. They tried to hide from God. Where are you? It's really the question of all of Scripture. Where are you? Yes. And God's relentless pursuit of us. So we don't have to hide because God invites us here to bring our questions before Him. But I think what we also have to be careful about, though, is that our questions come in an attitude of humility. See, as yeah. I have studied through Psalm 77, these are some of the things that stand out. In verse 11 through 13, the writer says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Your way is holy, O God. <laughs> what God is great like our God? That's a posture of humility. That's Asaph saying, I don't understand what's going on, but you're a great God. Yes. And so I'm going to bring this before you, not with a question of accusation, why are you doing this, God? But a question of what are you doing, God? Help yeah. me to understand what you're doing. Those are prayers of lament. You know, we see examples in Scripture where people didn't do oh so well with asking God things. The story of Job. <laughs> there was a point in Job's story, he was a righteous man, but as you move through the story in chapter 38, God comes to Job and he's, he asks a, a, a pretty strong statement. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the mm -hmm. earth? Tell me if you have understanding. <laughs> you see, yeah. what God was inviting mm -hmm. him to was to return to a posture of humility. Yes. And when I'm coming to the Lord with my questions, I have to remember that, that it's in humility. You see, if I don't have humility, then I haven't truly encountered who God is. Because if I know who God is, and it says there, you are a great God, then my response is, who am I? Just like yeah. Isaiah. <laughs> Those yeah. words, who am I? Send me. And so here's the, the posture here, a posture of humility. And so if I'm prideful, I'm distant. God is, is not going to be close to me. But if I'm yeah. humble, then it invites me to draw close to him. Yes. And so I challenge folks at home, if they're at a place of brokenness, to come before the Lord with their questions and just bring them before Him in a posture of humility. In verse 12, it says, I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. And so sometimes we just need to recount to ourselves, to those around us, here's where I've seen God at work, and I just need to talk about God's activity. Yeah. The counter of that is our grumbling. And boy, we can get good at grumbling. Oh, yeah. You know, here mm -hmm. it's essentially saying we can bring our complaints to God. The problem is when we start bringing our complaints to each other. And we look <laughs> in the story of Exodus, Exodus 17. What are the people doing? They're grumbling, but they're grumbling to each other. They're not bringing that to the Lord in brokenness. They're grumbling and complaining to each other. And we know the, the penalty of that, the water from the rock and all the, yeah. the complaint that was happening there. Well, the posture here is so different. It's humility. It's saying that I'm broken. I'm coming before the Lord. Here's all these questions, six questions that he's thrown out. And he says, yeah. I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, that image of hiking, when you're going up a, a really great height, what you really look forward to is getting to the top and yeah. seeing the view from there. You know, in the story of Gideon, there's a really neat aspect of that story. We studied it several weeks ago at our church. And when God encounters Gideon, He's not at the mountaintop. No. 
he's down in the valley. Uh, he's hiding mm -hmm. at the wine press. Mm -hmm. And so here's Gideon. He's hidden. He's afraid of the attacks of the enemy. And I love the words that are given to Gideon. It says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, I'm hiding down here. I'm afraid. Yes. But you know, that encourages me because God saw in Gideon what Gideon couldn't see in his present mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And for folks at home, that may be what they're seeing right now. All they have are questions. They have the climb. They have some, you know, hiccups along the way. They, they've seen some challenges. They haven't made it to the summit yet, and they can't see to the other side. Mm -hmm. They're like Gideon. They're down in the valley at this point. But they're hearing a word from God saying, oh, mighty man of valor. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Because God can see far beyond what we can see. Yes, he can. He can see how he's going to use us, and he can see even the resolution that is leading us to lament, to be broken. And so the invitation here to just bring our needs before the Lord. Mm -hmm. In the preface to Michael Card's book, Sacred Sorrow, he said, we have a whole generation of people with unresolved issues, hurts, and pains in their past that have been shallowly dealt with at best, and at worst, have been ignored and discounted completely. We have been unwilling to sit in our sadness and pain, and we've missed much of the intimacy that he longs to offer us. Wow. We need to sit in our sadness. We don't like to do that. We say, no. get me out of this. Move me out of this season fast. <laughs> and yet, in reality, God may need to teach us something in the midst of that season of sadness. We may be in that place of difficulty because God is wanting to, to shape us. You know, and I think many, in many ways it's, the distance from what's in our head and what's going on in our heart. You see in Psalm mm -hmm. 77, he has a broken heart at this point. Yeah. But at the same time, he is recounting in his mind what he knows, the distance of yeah. from head to heart. Mm -hmm. And so his heart's broken, but he says, I will remember the works of the Lord. In fact, remember is a key part of this passage. From verse 3, Asaph remembered God. Verse 6, he remembered his song in the yeah. night. Verse 11, he remembered the deeds of the Lord. He pondered the work of the Lord. And so the, the great reminder for us is just to say, you know what, your heart may be broken. You yeah. may be in a season of lament, but you know that God is good. You know that God is faithful. And so keep speaking the truth of God's word, not the pain of your situation. And that's what I think Asaph is modeling for us. And Richard Foster, he writes this in his book on prayer. He says, why does God seemingly require relinquishment before bringing something into being? God has to help us let go of our tiny vision in order to release the greater good he has in store for us. And for Asaph, he's looking at his predicament. We don't know all the details of what was going on that led to the writing of this yeah. psalm. We just know he was in a place of brokenness, and yet he was willing to bring those questions to the Lord to surrender his tiny vision because God had a greater vision, just like with Gideon, said, I can see yeah. you're a mighty man of valor. So. Yeah, God sees what we don't see. And right. I came to the conclusion quite a few years ago that we can ask God questions. Right. He's not afraid of our questions. Right. <laughs> He's God. Yeah. But to question God is a different story. Absolutely. To ask him questions is one thing, but to question him, right. God, why are you doing this? You right. need to tell me now, these kind of things. But when we just ask God questions, those questions that you read are really, are really hard questions. Right. And they can appear harsh. Right. But sometimes, and God knows, that's just how we feel inside right. and it comes out that way but he sees us how we really mean it. Right, and I think that leads back to that posture of humility because God yes. knows our heart and so we come, we're yes. pouring out our question before him and he knows our brokenness, he knows our desire to encounter him, not to come with that posture of accusation, yeah. but a, a posture of maybe confusion, but humility saying, Lord, I desperately need you. I want to read one more quote from Mark Brogoff. He said, while there may be painful circumstances beyond our control, our waiting can be spiritually productive as we intentionally follow the pathway to trust. That is why trust is active patience. We keep trusting by lamenting. And so that active, that active patience is lament, just poured out to the Lord saying, mm -hmm. God, I long to trust you even though I can't explain all that I'm going through.
because God is working all things for our good Amen. for those who love him who Amen. were called according to his purpose yes. and so even in those extremely difficult times and we've all been through them right. we've all been through difficult times we didn't understand why is this happening to me you know I, I have even asked God before where is God and what is he doing right. and even when those words came out of my mouth, I knew where God was. He was right there with me. Right. I didn't know the answer to the second question. What is he doing? But, you know, I did know that I loved him and that he would work all things together for my good. Amen. And he takes these very difficult, hurtful situations that we think are going to kill us we just know they're going to kill us. God, you're just going to let me die right here. We know there's no way out. But that little song that says, God will make a way right. where there seems to be no way. Right. So if you're in that place, if you're traveling up to the summit, aren't you proud there of me? You go. And your muscles are screaming because you're not used to having to do that. God is working everything out for your good. He loves you and he cares for you. So just keep walking. Keep walking with him. And when you say, where is God? You know where he is. He's right there with you. What's he doing? Well, we'll find out sooner or later and it'll turn out good. It always does because he loves us. Mm. And those of us who've given our lives to him and we're walking with him, He'll take care of us, and He will work everything for our good. The Haynes family going to sing for us again, where no one stands alone and glorious God.
We have a glorious God. He Amen. is glorious. Amen. And there, there's just no real way to fully describe him, is there? Oh, no. There is no way to describe the God that we serve. My little grandson said today, he was sitting there just like he was pondering something. He said, you know, some people don't even know that Jesus is real. I said, that's true. And I said, that's why we need to tell them. So if you don't know for sure that you believe Jesus is real tonight, let me tell you, He is. Amen. I know Him personally. Amen. I know Him personally. We have a lot of requests here. I'm just going to pray briefly over these right now, and we'll pray again a little later. Father, we thank, thank you, you that yes. you are real. You're a glorious yes. God. And I ask yes. you that you would touch yes. every yes. person, Lord, who yes. is represented yes. by these requests bring healing, bring calmness. Lord, I pray that you would bring understanding and that your Holy Spirit would minister. I ask it in Jesus' name. Our lives are in his hands and we need to just rest in that. We're gonna take a quick break, nothing long, so don't be gone long if you run to get something. I hope you'll stay with us because we still have a lot more and we don't want you to miss not even one small part of Nightline. Mm -hmm. 